Hello everyone and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Ben Frost. I'm the Public Information Officer of APA's Northern New England chapter and one of the coordinators of the Planning Webcast series. This series is brought to you by a consortium of over 40 of APA's chapters and divisions. The consortium itself is not affiliated with APA, but rather is a loose-knit uh, affiliation of uh, APA chapters and divisions that we um, put together to provide high-quality free webinars on topics important to planners that will also help them to meet their certification maintenance requirements. Today is Friday, February 10th, 2017, and we'll hear the presentation, Bicycling Innovations for Small Towns and Rural Communities. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar on the right side of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown here for a real technical support that I can't help you with. For content-related questions related to the presentation, please type those questions into the question box also located on the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. We will answer those as time allows at the end of the presentation during Q&A. Soon we'll have a list of uh, sponsoring chapters and divisions and if you're responsible for um, uh, making dues payments, uh, please do that so we can get you registered. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Wisconsin chapter of EPA. And here's a few of our upcoming webcasts. Uh, to register for those, please visit our website at www.ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And I can tell you that the uh, webcast on the 24th of February will be on ethics and will be good for ethics credit. And the one on the 10th of March will be on permaculture. Google that term and you'll know what it's all about. To log your credits uh, for attending today's webcast, follow these instructions. Log into your account on planning.org. Under the CM log, select a search for CM activities, and in the search bar, type that event number, the event number of today's webcast, which is 9118616. Uh, this information can be found on the Ohio Planning website. You can like us on Facebook to receive up-to-date information on upcoming sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. A PDF of PowerPoint will be available at the Ohio, uh, ohioplanning.org website. And I would like to turn it over to today's speakers, Andrew Dane and Tim Gustafson. Andrew? Thank you very much, Ben. Um, we'll... Uh, just take a minute to introduce ourselves. I'm Andrew Dane. I'm a senior community development specialist and a planner with SEH in Appleton, Wisconsin, a proud member of the Badger chapter and uh, help out as a, in sort of assistant role to our Northeast District uh, Director. Um, and today I'm going to uh, share a few case studies from a few projects I've been involved with. Um, that uh, one of which I worked with Alta Planning and Design on. Uh, so I'm going to share a few case studies today, but uh, really the main attraction for the webinar um, is Tim Gustafson from Alta Planning and Design, who is going to be showcasing this new um, guidebook that Alta has put together. So without further ado, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you for giving that little intro. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Andrew said, my name is Tim Gustafson, and I am a senior associate and the Chicago office manager for Alta Planning and Design. And as Andrew mentioned, uh, SEH and Alta have worked together on some projects, and that's actually one of the impetus opportunities that we found for today's presentation, um, because it gives us an opportunity to do two things, is to give you what we're calling a first look into the Small Town and Rural Multimodal Nits Works Guide. We call it the STAR Guide for short, and also to showcase some of those projects that Andrew mentioned. So I will be giving uh, the majority of the presentation today, but you will hear from Andrew a couple of times. And as uh, we mentioned, we've given each other an opportunity to kind of chime in as, as things come on. So very excited about that, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this project was actually funded originally by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, and uh, it was a very interesting project from the get-go because it was about kind of addressing that gap of design guidance. However, it caught the attention of the Federal Highway Administration, and that's uh, basically what led us to this becoming a much larger effort, which was very exciting because it uh, helped to elevate the status of the presentation and the guide and the guidance contained therein. 
The project team consisted of us, Alta Planning and Design, in partnership with Montana State University's Western Transportation Institute and the National Association of Counties. This slide shows you a general outline of how the guide is structured, and we're going to follow along loosely to that today to give you a sense of what's inside. So on this first look presentation, we'll go through basically the purpose of the guide, why it was created in the first place, uh, give you an overview of the structure and from which most of the information comes, the sources. Uh, we'll also go through the applications and how this can be done. This is where a lot of our case studies will come into play. And then also some of the benefits. And then we've also got a few more project examples here. And because of the chapters that we're featuring today, we've, we've hoped to show some of the upper Midwest, um, the Wisconsin, Indiana, and Ohio examples where they exist. So hopefully that can help to give you a sense of how this guide might be something that you also can use. And we've got a little bit of content at the end of the presentation for that as well. So first, let's jump into history and context. So as many of you may be aware, there are quite a lot of guides out there. There's quite a bit of guidance from the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, known as AASHTO. There's also a lot of guides from the Federal Highway Administration. We also reference some things from the Institute of Transportation Engineers. There's the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the Public Rights of Way Access Guidelines, and Bike Safe. So even though there's a lot of alphabet soup on this page, I assure you, um, the guidance has kind of been long in coming, and this guide continues to draw on that trend. And the reason I say that is because there's a lot of guidance that has evolved over time. And this STAR guide has been created to kind of address one of the shortcomings that we've learned and we've experienced over the years of providing planning and design assistance, is that there's a difficulty in tying some of those applications down to a smaller town or a suburban and possibly rural um, situation. So that's one of the things that we're talking about here today. The Federal Highway Administration in 2010 first started to give uh, guidance in helping to give people that flexibility that they were lacking before. And so in 2010 they released a policy statement that stated walking and bicycling foster safer, more livable, family-friendly communities. And then the thing that we've highlighted here is that they actively encouraged designers, state DOTs, and agencies of transportation to go beyond the minimum requirements to do this. This was one of the first times that they came out and stated a policy that FHWA guidance alone, AASHTO guidance alone is not the only way to go about this. There is an opportunity and there is a lot of great information in these additional guides. Shortly thereafter, you started to see a lot of guides come out, like the Institute for Transportation Engineers, the Walkable Thoroughfares, a context-sensitive approach in 2010. Uh, in 2013, uh, this is actually the most recent version of it, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, NACTO, released their Urban Street Design Guide. And this really provided a lot of guidance for how to apply bicycle facilities and pedestrian facilities, transit facilities. It was the first blush for that. Uh, and this is the most recent cover photo showing that. They also released the Urban Bikeway Design Guide. The latest version of that is a 2014 edition. This goes further in providing that guidance. Uh, I don't have a slide for the Transit Street Design Guide, but they also released one of those. So you get a sense there's a lot of good guidance that started to come out. In 2013, they also further encouraged that um, FHWA supports people taking a flexible approach, and this is where they actually started to call out the existence of these very guides. So rather than just saying, we encourage you to be flexible, they now have said, we encourage you to be flexible, and we think that these guides are a good place to start. So as I hinted before, we ask why create a small town guide in the first place? And it's because we've learned over the years that one size does not fit all. Um, I think most people would agree with that statement. And in my work, and I'm sure Andrew can attest to this as well, when you're planning and designing in smaller communities, they'll look at the NACTO guides. We were, we were involved in the creation of that one as well. They'll look at the NACTO guides and state, this is good and all, um, but it, I'm not quite sure this is the best fit for the kind of community that we have. Um, so some examples that kind of help to explain to that um, are here on this slide, because Longer trip distances have made things a little bit difficult. Um, all design issues aside, if there's open drainage or it's a rural cross-section, that alone was enough to make people wonder if some of this design guidance would fit. The other thing that's key is that small towns have longer distances between certain types of trips. 
such that a bike trip or a walking trip in an urban environment makes sense, it's a little more difficult in these smaller town environments. In addition to that, we know that there are health disparities. Those living in rural areas have higher rates of physical inactivity and chronic disease than those living in urbanized areas. We know that there are also higher crash rates. And this was interesting to note that while only 19% of the population of the country lives in designated rural areas, 58% of fatal crashes and 60% of traffic fatalities occur in these rural areas. So there's a disproportionate level of risk associated with rural roadway networks, and we know that we need to be sensitive to that. Lastly, we also know that urban households have annual incomes approximately 32% higher than rural households, so there's an income disparity issue at play as well. So the guide was created to truly take advantage, well, not take advantage, but to truly help to address some of these concerns. But where we want to take advantage of them is we know that there are some opportunities. Um, smaller towns also have a potentially more compact design. Therefore, even though trip distances between communities might be quite great, the trips into and across town might be much more feasible. So we've got some examples here. And the guide also includes a lot of examples from small towns and rural communities across the country, because one of the things that we felt was very important was to show you not only can this be done, but here's where it has been done before. So let's get into a little bit of guide content. So here's a screen that shows you generally what the table of contents looks like. Um, and you can see that it's split into six major areas. Um, we're currently in the introduction as far as the presentation and the guide is concerned. And there are three major categories for facility types. You'll see that there's mixed transportation, where it's a shared roadway environment, visual separation, and physical separation. There's also two sections in here that afford you a little bit more guidance in terms of making key network linkages, which we'll get into in a little bit, as well as some guidance for how to incorporate these types of facilities into your planning actions and your project development. So the layout of the guide is actually highly visual. Um, we've made a point of making sure that it's very easy to thumb through and that you can really get a sense of what's available. And the content areas give you a little bit of information in each of the areas of how to apply it, what some of the benefits might be, and what the guidance should be for each of these areas that are here in the sub bullet in terms of design, pavement markings, what signs should accompany it, what you do at intersections, how you go about implementing it, and what concerns or things need to be addressed in regards to keeping things accessible and consistent with the Americans with Disabilities Act. The other thing that I mentioned is that there are case studies throughout this guide. And I really like these because they give you a sense of the community context. And it's written in such a way that you can see what are the key elements of the project, what kind of a roadway or where in their community was this placed, and how is it funded? And this is key, I know, because a lot of people have questions about funding. The other thing that I encourage about this is if you see a really good example and you're familiar with the area, this also helps you narrow down the search for who to email or who to call. And you can actually talk to the people who have implemented this. And that's particularly helpful because we know that this is nice and current and recent, so you can reach those people. So as I mentioned, here are the three types of applications. We've got mixed traffic visually separated and physically separated. Um, I did want to note that this slide was put in here to also show you that these are project examples from around the country. And so from the left to the right, we have images from Frisco, Colorado, Lindenville, Vermont, and Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Now when it comes to creating a complete network, I want to emphasize, and you'll probably hear this emphasized by a lot of different people, and it's really good guidance, is that you really want to take into consideration the amount of automobile traffic and automobile speeds. And as you go up in either direction with increasing speed and increasing volume comes the need for greater separation. And that's why these categories are split into the mixed traffic, visually separated, and physically separated environments. So you can see that there's three categories, there's three general areas, and you will see that the guide is structured in order to help you navigate what is needed and where. Another thing about small towns and rural communities is that there's a need to understand that context can change. And then in smaller towns, context can also change sometimes more quickly than they would in an urban environment. You could go from an unimproved environment 
You can have agricultural or heavy vehicles. Sometimes small towns have a recreational component to them. And then they do have a downtown, and the downtowns are compact. They're, they're walkable, and they, you can enter into and exit a downtown rather quickly. So understanding how to apply design guidance in that more compact context is helpful. This type of a page accompanies all of the design treatments, and I really like this one because it helps you break it down between the speed and volume characteristics you need to meet, where in the network is this type of a facility appropriate, and then what are the land use characteristics that you want to take uh, consideration for. So as you can see here on the left, the speed and volume table shows you an area where the design treatment is preferred, but also gives you an idea of where there might be a potential to apply this. And you know your community best in saying, well, I understand that we might have slightly higher volumes, but speeds are still generally pretty low. Or we might have high speed, but it's an occasional car passing, so we can do something with the design of this that might still get us what we need. The same is true for the network of application. You can see guidance for each of these facility types and whether or not they are recommended on your local streets, your collector streets, or your main arterials, and even highways. And then this last item on the right shows land use context. You can see whether a oops, excuse me there. You can see whether a facility is recommended outside of built-up areas, within built-up areas, and then in some cases you'll see a guide where these two circles merge like a Venn diagram, showing you that this type of a treatment can work in both. So here are the facility types that we're going to cover under the mixed traffic category. We have the yield roadway, the bicycle boulevard, and the advisory shoulder. Yield roadway is first. So a yield road, roadway is designed to serve pedestrians, bicyclists, and other mo motor vehicle traffic in the same slow speed travel areas. These serve bi-directional vehicle traffic, and there are no pavement markings anywhere within the traveled area. So I want you to keep that in mind. So as you can see here, sorry, there was a slide out of order there. You can see here that the traveled way can vary in width. There's usually some sort of a shoulder environment, but as you can see, there's no formal pavement markings because these are intended for low speed and low volume roadways. Sometimes you will see them supplemented with some directional and warning signage here, as you can see in these MUTCD signs for the W6 and the W11 treatments. But as you can see, in a lot of situations, not much is needed for a yield roadway to exist. And this was important because I think for a lot of people it helps to legitimize that you don't necessarily need to do everything to all of your roadway networks if the speeds and the volumes are already where you want them to be. So in, in any event, I would say that the yield roadway treatment is also to legitimize some of the transportation network that's in this format and to be comfortable with the fact that maybe nothing else might be needed. However, if you do know that some more might be needed, there are additional treatments. And of course, the bike boulevard is the next style. Bike boulevard is a low stress shared roadway, but it's intended for bicycle traffic and that you do a few extra things to it in order to make bicycling comfortable for all users. And so this is a combination of pavement markings, some traffic calming, and even some traffic crossing improvements to help increase bicyclist comfort and also to manage automobile speeds or automobile volumes, depending on what it is you feel that you need a little bit more of. So here's an example in Wildwood, Missouri. Uh, it's a town with a population of 35,000 individuals. You can see here it's got some shared pavement, shared lane markings, or sharrows as you know them to be. And then later on in the network, you see it's just a shared roadway. They have striped an edge line on this roadway, but it may not necessarily be required. This one is up, probably applied for visibility purposes. So the next treatment that I want to talk about is a little bit new, and it is very experimental at the moment. Um, and so in injecting some levity, I've, I've put this on here as kind of a, a heads up that this is a, an advisory treat. This advisory shoulder is an experimental treatment. Um, <clears throat> But what I want to say about experimental treatments is actually something from the MUTCD is that sometimes when people hear the term experimental, they think that this is just kind of being tried out for the first time. 
Um, but the MUTCD actually provides pretty strong guidance on how to go about using experimental treatment. And experimental doesn't necessarily mean that it's brand new, but that it is relatively new in its application for this purpose. And a lot of the treatments that make their way into the MUTCD over the years sometimes go through this path in order to get approved. So there is a division on the MUTCD between what is an approved design treatment, what is subject to interim approval, and what follows the category of request to experiment. And that's where this advisory shoulder lies. So what is an advisory shoulder? So in this case, it is something that it establishes a shoulder on a roadway that would otherwise be too narrow to have shoulders. But if volumes and speeds are low enough, delineation of or changing the color of the pavement can help you to assign a space on the side of the roadway as a shoulder. Um, and it operates in kind of a narrow street roadway, as many of you may have already experienced. And so this is a situation where you can designate the advisory shoulder for the purpose of other uses, like this, for bicycle movement. And that automobiles can drive in the shoulder when there's no bicyclist present. But they must exit the shoulder to overtake a bicyclist. So as you can see, cars have to take turns to pass one another. Here's an example of a pavement marking plan for how this was applied in Norman, Oklahoma. This is a larger community, it's a college town. So there was a need to accommodate bicyclists, but the roadway was just a little bit too narrow, as you can see here. And so here's a, a slightly different shot showing kind of how they needed to make it work within the cross section. You don't have a traveled way that's wide enough for two vehicles to pass without making use of that shoulder. So it creates a very yield environment very low speeds and very low volume. Here's an aerial image showing kind of how that dash treatment gets you the advisory shoulder, but still shows that it is a narrow roadway. Here's an example of how that was done in Bloomington, Indiana, um, another college town, as a matter of fact. You can see a sidewalk on one side with curb and gutter on that side, but it's open drainage on the other. This dashed line treatment helps to assign an area for people to walk, as you see here on the right-hand side. And then there's a sidewalk on the other side, which allows for two-way movement, also does a better job of accomplishing bicyclists, because Bloomington is a very bicycle-friendly community. Here in Edina, Minnesota, you see a slightly different treatment. You see a parking lane adjacent to which has been striped the advisory shoulder for purposes of a bike lane. But that automobiles, as you can see, the minivan there, can travel in the advisory shoulder until they have to overtake a bicyclist. Here in the foreground, you see a bicyclist that was probably using the advisory shoulder to pass the parked vehicles, but she feels more comfortable in the parking lane closer to the curb after the fact, and that's entirely fine. Moving one step higher, if you have the space, the paved shoulder has a lot of added benefits. Uh, as we often tell people in rural and small town communities, Adding a little bit of width to your paved shoulder can go a long way in extending the pavement life of the roadway surface so it doesn't unravel at the edge by the, the gravel shoulder. It also happens to provide space for bicycling in some situations. Now, a paved shoulder in identifying on the roadway, um, you want to make sure that you've decided which users are intended for the shoulder. So as you saw previously in an advisory shoulder, sometimes it might serve as a walkway. We'll, we'll elaborate a little bit more on that in a bit. But if you pave the shoulder, um, you might want to make clear kind of how this is intended to be used. So paved shoulders on the edge of the roadways can be enhanced to serve as functional space for bicyclists and pedestrians um, in the absence of other transportation facilities. The minute you have a sidewalk available, obviously that shoulder is no longer intended exclusively for bike and ped use. It becomes a shoulder use as the roadway currently exists as well as for bicyclists, if you deem it necessary. As you can see here on the far right of this slide, here's another application of that speed and volume table. And you can see quite a lot more um, flexibility in the preferred application with regard to operating vehicle speeds and volumes. And that we show that it's hashed out as potentially useful in lower speed and lower volume environments. This is basically telling you, you really only want to start considering these in these environments, but if you really want to put them in the lower speed, lower volume, you're certainly welcome to consider that. And then as far as network connectivity, this is, this is intended for the longer distances between towns, for example, um, and out on your regional arterial networks. But again, keep in mind speed and volume and what you need to do for 
separation and the buffer as shown here from moving traffic. As far as land use, this can be used within and outside of built up areas. Here are a couple of applications as you can see in Lake St. Louis by adding that extra width of shoulders. You allow bicyclists to ride where they are most comfortable away from moving traffic. You also give moving traffic the comfort of knowing that they have plenty of space between uh, themselves and the shoulder so that everybody feels a little bit more comfortable in that environment if you couldn't provide a different facility type, for example. Uh, on Route 100, in the photo on the right, you can see in a higher speed application the addition of rumble strips. And so the guide also contains guidance, so does AASHTO, on how to provide rumble strips. And you can see here it's under the edge line. This has the added benefit of keeping it out of an area where either the motorist or the bicyclist would be traveling. It also has added visibility in uh, low light conditions. So this is actually a recommended practice in both of the guides uh, because it keeps the rumble strips out of the way of bicycles travel paths. Um, and then as you may have seen in the earlier slide, providing regular brakes, the guidance is in this guide as well as AASHTO, providing regular brakes for a bicyclist to swerve or avoid a potential conflict in the shoulder should also be included in the design. So moving on to visually separated facilities, I think it's important to still recognize that the good old-fashioned bike lane is still alive and well and still is a great way to designate an exclusive space for bicyclists using pavement markings and the optional sign. If a bike lane is located directly to a motor vehicle travel lane, it's the same, same direction movement. It is intended for all sorts of applications in terms of volume and speed. There still are some upper limits to this one as well. Um, and these are probably most appropriately located on your collectors and your arterials. These also have a land use application within and outside of built up areas. The guide does still touch on the guidance on how this can be used and we felt it was still important to include it in this one even though there's guidance all over the place on bike lanes because it still is a good way to include a facility and even though this image may show curb and gutter type style that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't put a bike lane on a uh, roadway that has a gravel shoulder, provided the adequate riding surface is wide enough. And that's really what it comes down to. So here's a great example of that in Wildwood, Missouri as well. The old Route 66, where it's actually a lower speed than it might suggest from the photo, is you've got that shoulder width. You can put the bike lane in there and designate it for use by bicyclists. So this is a great example. Um, I would, however, say that this was a roadway resurfacing project and they did a little bit of shoulder widening. I would actually suggest that you bring that shoulder up so that it's flush with the edge of the bike lane as well. Uh, you don't want a lip causing you to, to tumble down that shoulder. So you, you might want to add a little bit more to your, gravels to, make to your gravel shoulders to make sure that things are as flush as possible. And that could also be a function of uh, it being constructed a few years before. So at this point, I'm actually going to turn it over to Andrew, who will give us a little bit of a case study on some of these applications and how they worked in Fish Creek. All right. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. So I'm going to share a little case study here to talk on from Fish Creek, Wisconsin, which is a small town of a uh, few hundred people that basically mushrooms up to, you know, five or ten thousand people in the summer highly uh, seasonal tourism economy located just outside of uh, Wisconsin's I think number one or number two most popular state park Peninsula State Park um, and it the, the town sits uh, adjacent to the park um, parks in Wisconsin are kind of a big deal they've uh, estimate about a 650 million dollar per year impact on the local economy and Fish Creek is certainly a place uh, and a downtown and a tourist hub that uh, really thrives uh, off of its relationship with the park um, very popular park um, gets highly visited throughout the throughout the uh, tourism season um, so in some ways perhaps similar to as, as I was flipping through the guide here um, talks about Moab there's a case study in the very end of the book that talks a little bit about Moab the guide in some ways I think Fish Creek has some similarities there it certainly has some wonderful assets in terms of trails uh, both uh, uh, single track and um, crushed limestone trails and chip trails uh, within the park um, and it's got some excellent uh, road cycling sort of out in the countryside just outside of town um, and yet it doesn't really have a good network um, 
to sort of mesh it all together um, across the landscape. The guide talked about the importance of creating networks and, and recognizing the fact that they're not, you know, networks are, are not really delivered by a single trail or a sidewalk or a bike lane um, necessarily. They're oftentimes composed of many different types of facilities um, that support walking and biking throughout a community. And so um, in Fish Creek, um, one of the challenges or some of the challenges are um, sort of illustrated in some of the photos here, um, some significant uh, safety concerns, um, poor accessibility uh, to the park, difficult access, not a lot of alternatives in terms of getting to and from uh, the park and downtown, um, and not particularly comfortable. Um, the bottom uh, um, right slide um, sort of illustrates um, uh, perhaps a different perspective in that, you know, the bicyclists and the pedestrians have become so comfortable in town sort of owning the street that it almost has this sort of European uh, sort of feel to it where um, there are so many bikes and pedestrians out in the street on some of the side streets that um, it becomes this mixed environment and the vehicles tend to slow down. However, out on the main street, illustrated in um, the photos on the top, you've got the uh, is, is the primary spine between the state park and the downtown shopping district. And there's where we have a lot of issues in terms of safety and a lot of um, challenges. A lot of the bikers either end up on the narrow sidewalk in conflict with um, pedestrians or um, out in the street in fairly heavy traffic um, conditions. So um, I think you can go to the next slide, Tim. Um, in our previous, we did a previous waterfront master plan, and in that project, we identified some uh, um, concepts and, and some preliminary thoughts on what, the, what a pedestrian and bike trail system might look like. And um, we identified a number of different options: um, shared lanes, pedestrian sidewalks, trails, mixed-use trails, even a tunnel uh, in the area over to the right of the screen. Uh, that sort of connects the large uh, green state park on the north side of the dotted line to the uh, south uh, uh, park, which is a town facility. So during the planning process, interestingly enough, um, part of the, uh, we got some feedback from some uh, business owners in town that suggested, what if we actually um, took out a lane of parking uh, and turn that into a bike lane? Um, and, and the discussion was um, out there during the preparation of the plan. Um, it was a little too controversial to make it into the final plan because this is a seasonal uh, tourism economy and people have some real concerns about removing that much parking from, from the roadway. Um, so it, this idea of potentially taking a stretch of between sort of the heart of the of the downtown district to the park, um, this idea didn't make it into the um, converting a lane of parking into a bike lane did not make it in, into the plan. Um, fast forward a little bit to um, a couple months ago, the towns um, uh, hired SEH, retained SEH again to assist them with some additional work. Um, and they've asked us now to um, go back and take a fresh look at this um, section of street uh, and, and, and have um, asked us to um, work with Alta on putting together a proposal for um, doing a demonstration project. So the demonstration project would be along the dashed line. Um, so working with Tim and his counterpart, Colin, over in Minneapolis, we've come up with a proposal to convert one lane of that parking um, through cones, reflective tape, and paint, um, convert one lane uh, into an on-street bike lane, um, and do that for a couple different periods over the course of the summer, um, multiple days. Um, and to do some evaluation, talk to business owners, talk to uh, townies, talk to visitors, find out um, how it, uh, it works for them, or what they like, what they don't like about it, and try to get a handle on um, uh, what are the, you know, are there, what are the safety benefits and costs? What are the economic benefits and costs? Um, and we want to, I think, find out is this a, is there a potential for doing something differently along the stretch? Um, which could be uh, the answer, maybe no, um, or the answer may be um, let's look at a one-way bike lane um, is one option. Another alternative could be a side path, a bi-directional bike and ped path on the southern or, or uh, 
southern or northern part of the street, or perhaps a separated, even a separated bike lane. Um, so sort of going back to this guide, thinking about the different applications and then running those as alternatives for a study uh, demonstration project. So we are in the um, proposal phase right now for this project and uh, have uh, will be working with the town and the DOT to see if we can uh, uh, do this demonstration this summer. Um, and just want to share then a few, um, I guess, just um, quick lessons learned or reflections on this project so far. Um, and that is, um, as I've known, as I've found out in other communities, um, size of the community, these small towns can be very complex. And so just because it's a rural area doesn't mean um, the issues are simple. Um, and also um, sort of reiterating the fact that you know these plans that we come up need to be flexibly implemented and and revisited and so even though we didn't in this case um, have this idea make it into the into the previous plan the community has said you know this this idea that the community sort of grasped onto is being brought forward and uh, tested so to speak Tim uh, next slide all right Yep. So this is basically the, the pilot. This is uh, just some slides from some previous work that Ulta Planning and Design has done and sort of graphically showcases the type of demonstration that we've got planned for uh, hopefully this summer. Next slide. All right. That's great, Andrew. And thank you. I think it's also worth noting that Andrew also brought up kind of how small town and rural uh, areas also deal with seasonal changes in traffic, like you said, when the population balloons, uh, there is a need sometimes because the majority of people coming to an event or coming through town actually will be using active transportation, whether they'll be walking or bicycling. And so what might be needed in the off season can change in the, uh, the peak season. And so as Andrew mentioned, by doing a demonstration project or a temporary installation, much like you would for a farmer's market or a parade or any other festival where you change the roadway network in some capacity. This guide also kind of uses that as an opportunity to say you can do that with also just the roadway's performance and which modes are accommodated and when. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity to kind of open everybody's flexibility up a little bit more to say, you know, we don't necessarily have to commit to this 12 months out of the year. Uh, and so that's why the demonstration projects provide a way to do it for a lower cost, also knowing that that set in, in implementation is temporary. Uh, so now I want to move on to another advisory treatment. Uh, again, this is one that is somewhat new and still has some questions on where is it best suited and how do you accommodate, um, and that is the pedestrian lane. So as we talked about the paved shoulder, sometimes the designation of a pedestrian lane, and you can see bicyclists here in the traveled way, is another way to go about accommodating users in a rural and small town network. So a pedestrian lane, and this, is, this stresses the importance that it's an interim or temporary pedestrian facility that may be appropriate on roads with low to moderate speeds and volumes. The lane may be on one side of the street, which I think is actually more common so far, or on both sides, and it can help to fill gaps between important destinations in the community, particularly in an area where sidewalks are deemed not feasible for one reason or another, or there's a lot of resistance to put in a facility that is considered to be quote unquote too urban for the context of the land use that you're, that you're dealing with. Um, but there are ways to accommodate them. And so you can see here that you often want to see a, a warning sign showing that pedestrians will be on the roadway in these environments, because again, this is a temporary or gap filling measure. You do want to designate that said facility is for pedestrians only. And this is because of the accessibility concerns and also potential conflicts between bicyclists in a shoulder and pedestrians walking in a shoulder. This is truly to say this area needs to be for pedestrians because of a specific reason. Um, as I mentioned, they're temporary or interim. They're not to be an alternative to sidewalks. And I know that in a lot of projects I've done over the years, sometimes there is a, a hesitancy to embrace sidewalks as a solution or that gray just doesn't allow you to widen the roadway, or putting in sidewalks in an open drainage swale just changes the entire situation. So this really is intended to fix some of those tougher spots. Um, and as part of the planning process, you do want to think about how you're addressing these following issues. If this is a pedestrian facility, it needs to be accessible, so you need to know how to detect roadway crossings. 
the edge of the sidewalk facility, for example, and think about people that are using wheelchairs versus people with vision disabilities. Um, you do want to make sure that you are clear that this is a pedestrian facility and that you don't have a situation where you have a lot of bicyclists that want to be over here. If that's the case, you want to consider a different facility type. Um, in making sure that something is accessible, you do want to make sure that you're thinking about your cross slope requirements. And then also, how are you going to sweep it in the summer if you do street sweeping, and how you're going to plow it in the winter and make sure this is not where the snow piles up. This is also part of the clear zone. But they do have applications, and as you can see here in Detroit, Oregon, very small town, this is not the area where you're going to want to go ahead and build a completely separate sidewalk facility. So designation of a pedestrian lane, as you can see here, it's two-way on one side of the road. Uh, seems to help address their concerns. You still have a place for people to go walking and jogging and walk their dogs. And uh, it may have some seasonal and recreational applications where you've got a lot more traffic in one part of the year than in the other. So you can see this is how a facility would be applied in this situation. Very low speed, very low volumes, but just a little bit of pavement marking can help carve out just a little bit of space for pedestrians. Moving on from the pedestrian lane, you've got your more typical side path. Um, and you will see that there's a designation here between what is considered to be a side path and what is considered to be a shared use path, which is the next treatment that I'll cover. A side path is a bi-directional shared use path that is located immediately adjacent to and within the right of way of a road. They can offer a high quality facility that's completely separated from the roadway, but it travels along a roadway and as such, there will be sometimes a very regular or frequent occurrence where there are roadway and driveway crossings. Um, but it helps to get you the facility type that you're looking for. Here you can see in the guide what the minimum required separation uh, can be, whether or not you're doing it with just open drainage and grass, whether you're choosing to put a barrier between moving traffic and the side path, or if you're using the rumble strip treatment as was shown in the shoulder application. But as you can see here, this is still separate from the roadway. You've got a break in the pavement, a gap with rumble strips on the roadway, the shoulder, and then a side path after that. So it's not a continuous roadway surface, uh, because then that would basically be a similar treatment to a shoulder. As far as speed and volume context, you can see that there's a lot of application for the higher speed and higher volume roadways. So this comes in handy when you need more separation from moving traffic than can be afforded by putting something on the roadway. And as such, this is usually applied in your collectors and your arterials uh, and has application both in built up areas and outside of them. Here's an example for town and country Missouri. You can see here they chose to separate it with just the, the grass area, which also has an open drainage situation going on. So you have the traveled way, which is the roadway here, a separation and the side path. And it's very clear through the design and the treatment of each, which one is a roadway and which one is a side path. Here's an example from South Lake Tahoe, where it's a little bit more treatment has been given, but it provides a very pleasant and attractive facility type that runs along a major roadway. And sometimes these side paths are really helpful because the right of way is there. And so as long as the right of way is there and the grades are appropriate, you can get that facility in within a transportation envelope. Uh, and this is particularly helpful because if you think about what type of a land use is adjacent to it, you may have sensitive lands, you may have ecologically sensitive areas, you could have wetland issues. So by keeping it within the roadway right of way, you seek to possibly avoid having to acquire anything beyond what is already available. Now, slightly different from that is a shared use path. And a shared use path is basically a side path, but is completely away from and not within the right of way of a roadway. More often than not, shared use paths are going through forest preserves or uh, large parks, and they cross roadways at specific and key locations. So as you can see over on the right, you can see that those images for the speed and volume and the network guidance are a little bit different. Speed and volume, they basically say, you're completely separated. You just need to worry about the crossings. As far as networks are concerned, they're saying, these are independent of your roadway network. And then for land use treatments, obviously this is outside of a built up area. So shared use paths are intended for all non-motorized traffic. I have received questions on how people talk about motor assist bikes, but we won't get into that today. But this is intended for all users, and they're a very low stress and a high comfort facility. 
And as you can see, the guide get, gives you some street crossing guidance. And when we say street crossing guidance, I feel like I should have just said roadway crossing guidance because in some, many situations, you're not crossing an urban street, for example. You could be crossing a country road. So the guide gives you guidance on what to do when this shared use path encounters a crossing. Uh, in other trainings I've given, we go into quite a, quite a detailed module on how to slow users as they approach, how to alert motorists as they approach, and how everybody can mitigate that crossing, and how you assign the right-of-way in that crossing. So the guide gives similar guidance here as you will find in the uh, AASHTO bike guide, for example. So I'm going to turn it, um, this is actually something that we worked on, I'm going to speak to a little bit, but Andrew, feel free to to chime in. The uh, Appleton Trails Master Plan was also something that we worked on. Um, and this is more to kind of show how you identify the network. So Andrew, did you want to speak to this one at all? Sounds like he's on mute. OK. So um, in general, I would say that when we were looking at the facility connections here, one of the opportunities that we found is in finding where you can get path types because this was definitely focusing on things that were separate from the roadway. Um, but you have to get a little bit creative. And so this is not entirely new, um, but it is something that we wanted to highlight in this situation, is that sometimes your utility corridors, if determined to be feasible, might also provide you an opportunity to put trails in an otherwise small town and suburban environment, but using this guide for what facility types, where in the network it might apply, and then how to deal with the roadway crossings. So you can see here, within a 100-foot right-of-way uh, that has high-tension power lines, yes, it is possible to put in paths along these. You do want to worry about engagement and public engagement about what are the impacts and is it safe. Um, so you want to think about that in your design. Uh, but as long as you've got room to, foot, to put your 10-foot uh, minimum, here we show a 12-foot path with two-foot shoulders on either side, you can get a very high comfort high quality, low stress facility in a, in a suburban or small town environment that may not have many other opportunities, may not have a lot of natural resource corridors. So this was an example where we chose to show how it would be proposed in this environment. Hey Tim, I'm, I'm back. Um, oh, if you welcome wanna... back. <laughs> you were right, I did have my phone on mute. Yeah, why don't you go back to that first slide. Um, so just sharing quickly a little, this case study. Um, I know you've got a few more slides to go through, so we'll make this quick here, Tim. But uh, in this case, this project, just a case say to sort of talk a little bit about from a planning perspective, how do we um, do active transportation planning and connect it back to um, uh, our other uh, planning and budgeting processes? So what was, I think, kind of unique and, and, and um, innovative with this project was that we, um, what we did is um, we were hired on, SCH was hired on by the city to update the city's comprehensive plan uh, and rewrite the downtown plan. And then uh, concurrently with that, the city um, had put out an RFP for development of a trails master plan. So for the trails master plan, Ulta was the prime and, and we were the sub. But uh, what we did working with Ulta and the city is we integrated the public involvement so that during our issues and opportunities workshops, um, during our um, downtown charrette and during our um, uh, uh, workshop presentations, we were taking the active transportation planning that was occurring as part of the Appleton Trails Master Plan and we were sort of seamlessly integrating it in with the comprehensive plan update. So um, I thought this was a neat way to approach it. Um, it was a great hook to get more people to participate in the comp plan um, and it gave us a really robust, robust um, set of um, public involvement um, opportunities. Um, these, um, this trails master plan then was taken to a preliminary engineering level and we were able to develop a really accurate costs for and preliminary design for five uh, priority trails and then we put together a funding strategy and um, grant strategy um, to uh, present to the city uh, so they could integrate that into their capital improvement plan and get rolling on, on project implementation right away. Um, this slide um, is an example of a, of a kind of a unique technologies that we used on this project. This was um, 
a community remarks um, website uh, that we built into the, our, our project website allows people to click on a on a point in the downtown and leave a comment on a map. We received several hundred comments related to bike and ped uh, transportation planning. Um, we also used, if you want to flip to the next slide, some uh, interesting uh, heat mapping and online um, uh, input um, where we asked people to um, go to uh, some uh, websites and we asked people, I think the one on the left is the question, um, which trails do you use the most? So we asked people which trails do you mo use the most and those were the responses on the left where you've got the thicker trails designated and then on the right we asked people which trails, um, where would you like to see trails um, in the community? So we used a whole bunch of both online and in-person um, techniques here um, in surveys and charrettes and workshops to get a, a really robust participation into the trails plan. Next slide. Um, and I'll just share just a few quick lessons learned again here. Um, for this project, um, we, the size of the city, it's about 70,000 people, but I think um, a lot of medium-sized, small to medium-sized communities face similar challenges to these rural communities. They don't have good um, interconnected networks. And so what we found in Appleton was, as we dug into the trails planning, we had to really look at uh, holistically at the 15 communities around Appleton to also understand um, how this plan relates to the region, um, and then how do we um, essentially move from very urban environments in our core downtown uh, into very suburban and rural environments where we have a whole other sort of set of, of strategies and um, engineering approaches. So I thought it was interesting to, to look at these medium-sized communities that have both very urban and rural challenges um, and solutions. Tim, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, as you can see here, just a couple more examples as we're moving on. We're nearing the end of this. Uh, here sh here's another way to show kind of how a shared use path would encounter uh, a roadway crossing. And here, most of the treatments in place, I would say, do, the, do what they need to. Um, as far as the gates are concerned, you want to make sure that those are open when the, the trail is open, obviously. And there's a lot of other design treatments that you can use um, in addition to these or in, in place of these that will still get you what you need without having to invest in putting a lot of posts in the ground and then driving some gates into them. So um, we can get into that in Q&A if people do have questions on that sort of a treatment. Um, here's another uh, project that we wanted to include uh, because of it was particularly unique in how it was paid for. Uh, this is actually a crowdfunded study um, and that the Buffalo County community actually was really interested in putting together connection uh, feasibility for being part of the Mississippi River Trail. Um, so a lot of the MRT involves some on-street connections, uh, but there are some trail alignments here as well. Um, the funding came from a Buffalo County CapEx 2020 fund, and then there were township level letters of support and local businesses also expressed support. So that was what allowed it to, uh, to happen. And so the study included coming up with the facility types, and a lot of the types that you see here on the map came from finding out how does this guidance apply in a smaller town and rural cross-section situation. Pretty high level planning cost estimates. Uh, and then how do they go about implementing it if you're trying to do this across an entire county? How do you have municipalities pay a share? How do you have the county pay a share? So it was coming up with some strategies and recommendations for that as well. Here just near the end, we have, uh, there is a section of the guide that talks about how a sidewalk can be applied I don't think we need to get very specifically into the guidance for a sidewalk, but it does reiterate that there are situations in small towns and rural environments where providing that dedicated and paved space separate from the roadway can have a lot of potential benefits in just improving the comfort and safety for pedestrians. So even though sometimes I would say sidewalks get perceived as too urban for my town situation, um, there are small, there are some areas where a sidewalk is very helpful very necessary. And the guide does make reference to how putting sidewalks within the most recent thousand feet or more of a school might be all you need so that you can start to funnel those higher volumes of pedestrians in that particular land use. So as you can see in the lower right of this slide, these sidewalks are strategic for small town and rural environments when you're talking about built up areas. The separated bike lane makes an appearance in this guide as well. Um, I think before this guide existed, the, the separated bike lane was probably perceived 
maybe second only to the sidewalk, is one of the most, quote unquote, too urban for this type of a treatment environment. But there still is application for the separated bike lane. And for those of you who are less familiar with it, a separated bike lane is a facility for exclusive use by bicyclists that's located within or directly adjacent to the roadway. It is still physically separated, but it achieves this interesting objective, and that's why this image was selected. It is not a shoulder. It is not a side path, because you can see it's still separated from the pedestrian pathways, but it still travels in the same direction as and along with motor vehicle traffic, such that it needs its counterpart on the other side of the roadway. There are treatments where a two-way protected separated bicycle lane may work. For that guidance, I would say in getting into the nuance, you want to actually consult NACTO and the MassDOT Separated Bike Lane Design Guide. But in rural context, there are lots of opportunities where this may work. As you can see, it has a lot of speed and volume context applications. It is intended for your collectors and your arterials because the smaller roadways may not need something this robust. But it is intended for use in the built-up area. Here's an example of a facility that is a two-way protected facility that was needed for a very short distance in Red Wing. And uh, Andrew, if you want to get uh, ready to go on unmute, you're welcome to join in. This is a project uh, that actually was um, involved Alta coming up with a solution to help people get from a trail network to an on-street bike network that involved getting to a bridge. And so it was a somewhat constrained environment uh, where we needed to provide design guidance on how do you do that in a short distance in an otherwise pretty compact urban environment such that you don't have a lot of need to cross multiple legs of a downtown cross section. So Alta came up with some ideas showing how you can do a two-way facility on one side of the street by mitigating potential conflicts at driveways. This was a, a very fortunate situation where we didn't have a lot to deal with. Um, to find a way to get a two-way separated, we call it a protected because there's a curb separating you from moving traffic, um, to get you to that bridge. And so you see a couple of cross sections here. Uh, and here's what the roadway looks like today. Moving forward, we have an example here from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This shows that it's a separate facility from the roadway. It is elevated up at curb level. Uh, and then you can see there's a sidewalk on the right. Interesting story about this one is before this treatment was installed, there was actually a shoulder. Uh, and the bike lane was designated here in this space here to the left between the edge line of the roadway and the face of the curb. But if you're, if you're seeing here in the photo, you can see that basically that means that the bicyclist would be traveling right on the seam between concrete and asphalt on the, the beginning of the gutter pan. It's a really unpleasant and an uncomfortable way to find oneself, so you usually tend to pick the asphalt or the concrete and just use that. That reduces your total available width for actually riding. So when they came along and they improved this area, they added some asphalt at sidewalk level uh, for the protective facility, such that the sidewalk drains to the shoulder as well into the grass. The separated bike lane drains into the uh, dirt shoulder and across the sidewalk as needed, and also into the curb and roadway. Uh, and so you can do this in a situation without a whole bunch of changes to your drainage situation. But I, I will caution that if you're doing something like this, you want to think about which way the drainage is going to go and into what type of facility. So it can be done in these environments. And in smaller towns, it may have a really good application, particularly if you're coming from a wide paved shoulder environment out in the more rural areas and you're coming into town, you may want to move bicyclists into an area where they feel more comfortable. The guide has a little bit, I'm going to touch on this lightly, about network opportunities and places where you might want to be strategic about managing speeds. Uh, this is where the pedestrian lane actually lives in the guide. Um, so it's, even though we show that as a visual separated facility because of what it is, this is where it ended up in the guide because of some of that uncertainty of application. Um, I mentioned about how you might want to do certain things in the vicinity of schools, where you don't want to do something for an entire network, but near the schools it might be needed more. Multimodal main streets, bridges, and access to public land. So in the interest of time, I do apologize. I will touch on these a little bit. We've already covered the pedestrian lane. Um, there is some guidance for how to reduce speeds in rural environments, because as many of you know, you may have a posted speed of 45 and 55 out in the country. You come through a small town and you're asking them to come down to 35 in a very short period of time as it's perceived by the motorist, but you really want help in helping to really enforce that and bring those speeds down. So there's some ideas for how that can be done. 
Uh, there's some guidance for making specific site treatments as you get closer to schools because you, again, want to send that message that you're changing the context of your environment. Lots of safe routes to school planning is intended to communicate just that. This also has application for those schools that are located in small towns and rural communities. For multimodal main streets, there's a lot of different scenarios that are presented for how you can reconfigure your downtown's main street just in that area to accommodate more users. Because as I mentioned, you have more users approaching your downtown of various modes than you may have out on the more rural cross section. So knowing what you can do when you get into town to help co communicate that, there's some guidance for how to do so in situations where your downtown street is two lanes, four lanes, or more. There is a section on bridges. And uh, I'm glad that this section is in here because in a lot of trainings, you may have a great facility network that leads up to a very narrow bridge. And for many reasons, we all know that that bridge deck or that bridge surface or that superstructure will not be rehabilitated anytime in the near future. So you want to think about how you can get creative with what can you do if you're just resurfacing it? What do you do if you're getting a new bridge deck? Uh, and how do you separate facilities for that short period? And keeping in mind that you want to be flexible, and I think that users recognizing that they're approaching a very constrained facility, you, you want to make sure that you can do something more than just say, oh, one of these facilities just has to go away for a while. There's also some consideration for what you might want to do when providing access to public lands, this recreation theme that I touched on earlier. Uh, this also gives you an opportunity to use different funding sources in order to provide facilities as you approach these national parks. Uh, this image is from Moab, Utah, uh, for access to the Colorado Riverway path, for example. Um, these may draw visitors from other places, which also might create for some support for why you need to do something a little bit different than you do elsewhere in the community. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Andrew as we close out to kind of give you some ideas for how we have been helping communities to start using this guide and what you might be able to do after today. Okay, thanks, Tim. So we wanted to end the uh, note, the uh, the presentation, with just some practical suggestions, ideas for for moving forward and and presumably doing something. Um, so came up with a few. I'll go over these very quickly. Um, we'll get into some Q and A. So um, as Tim mentioned, the guide's available for free online. Um, you can Google it. You can find it. We've got a slide coming up with the with the URL. Um, there's great little graphics in here. Um, I think this is all public. Doc, uh, document now, so this is the type of really practical diagrams and information that you can pluck out of here, put into a report, put into a, a staff memo, uh, share um, with with the local elected official, um, host a training. Um, Tim and I have done um, trainings before. Tim's doing a lot of trainings right now. Um, would be love to um, host a training, uh, set up a, a follow-up webinar discussion to learn more. Um, I My personal favorite as a planner, I always like to get local elected officials and other movers and shakers into a preferably a, a van um, and go visit other projects that have been done. There's nothing um, better than getting people out and looking at, at projects and um, going to see them to, to build support. Uh, of course, preparing or updating a bicycle and pedestrian plan. Um, uh, Alta, of course, um, put together a wonderful resource uh, which is called the Creating Walkable and Bikeable Communities, a user guide to developing pedestrian and bicycle master plans. So that's also out there. You can Google that. That was uh, Alta and the Initiative for Bicycle and Pedestrian Innovation. That's a great resource that I like to uh, steal ideas from. Next slide. Um, organize a demonstration project uh, is another option, um, such as the one I mentioned in Fish Creek. Um, integrate active transportation planning goals and objectives into your comp plan. Uh, as a planner, that's one of my favorites. And um, the, uh, just an example from Appleton where we were able to, since we were doing the projects concurrently, we were able to cross-reference and, um, and integrate um, objectives and policies that supported the uh, Trails Master Plan and other active transportation within the comp plan. And then finally, um, updating, revisiting, or developing a complete streets uh, policy. Um, I believe that APA has now made all these past reports available at no extra charge for all you APA members out there. And Tim, next slide. All right, thank you. And as, as Andrew mentioned, 
Uh, the copy of the guide is free on the FHWA website. Um, so if you just start um, searching for FHWA Small Town and Rural Multimodal Networks Guide, um, you can find it. The PDF is absolutely free through their publications page. Um, and that's always been something that I appreciated about this guide is that there's no barrier for you to getting it and flipping through on your own. It is uh, very highly visual and as uh, both Andrew and I are planners, I can, I can attest that um, giving good design guidance and giving good ideas in a very pictorial environment is a great way to getting some ideas flowing. Um, but all of the renderings have been checked to make sure that they are actually showing the way that the designs should be done. And that, again, these always kick back that design guidance for where you go in the MUTCD to make sure that your pavement markings, your signs, your traffic control devices are all adequate. Um, you also can visit an interactive website. So if you're just showing somebody for the first time, or this is a council presentation where you want to say, we've got this great resource now, this one allows you to just flip through, and it allows you to pick things. It's also got a great photo library, so you can go and get these images for all of the facilities that have been done. And so Alta prepared a website, ruraldesignguide.com. You're welcome to go there. And as Andrew, mes uh, as Andrew mentioned, you can always contact us if you have more information uh, or questions about it. Um, and so with that, we're going to turn it back over to Ben. Thanks a lot, guys. That was a, a really great presentation. I'm, uh, I'm so excited both as a, as a professional planner and, and also as the, the chairman of the planning board in my small town. Uh, I, I live in central New Hampshire. We've got a, a town of about 2,800 people. We're undertaking a, a rewrite of our, our comprehensive plan. And I, I think uh, I'm glad we we've, we've, uh, haven't gotten to the, the transportation chapter yet because um, I think you've provided us a lot of resources we can use. Uh, I, I, we have a bunch of questions, but I, I had a couple myself, too. And, um, and this gets to... Um, the, the advisory shoulder, and Tim, you were talking about this early on, as an experimental treatment that is within the MUTCD. Uh, and I'm wondering, what is their connection um, also with AASHTO? And I ask this because a lot of times when uh, local planning boards are considering uh, design changes or local public works departments are considering design changes, a principal concern is, well, what's the liability associated with it? Certainly. And actually, that was one of the questions we always prepare for, because it, every time we give a presentation about something that's experimental, the first question is, what is the liability? Um, so to clarify and answer your question, the first thing I will say is that the process by which municipalities or agencies can do an experiment, the guidance for that is contained in the MUTCD. So Section uh, 1A.10 of the MUTCD shows you what data you need to collect, how you can formally ask for the ability to, re to experiment, who has to give the request, and then once it is approved, there are requirements for how you collect data before installation, after installation. It's basically you have agreed to enter into a, a controlled experiment um, with this but knowing that you're going to monitor it because we know that it has potential to provide uh, an improvement in the roadway network, but you're doing it within a very regimented, agreed upon system that is agreed to by the Federal Highway Administration. And so in providing some protection at the federal level, if you're following that process, you are still being consistent with the protection afforded you of the manual and uniform traffic control devices. So. We actually have prepared some smaller modules, and there is guidance on the MUTCD website and a couple of white papers that talk about helping communities address their concerns about legal liability for doing something that is perceived to be experimental. The second half of your question is, once it is placed within a guide, like the Small Town and Rural Multimodal Networks Guide, that is the guide that you cite as the source from where the idea came from, and that you're using that design idea and the MUTCD's guidance for how to apply it. So it's a two-part system. It does require the preparation of some paperwork. Um, we help communities do that in a lot of situations because more often than not, you'd be surprised, in some of these environments, you have either a desire to use something that's experimental or perhaps even documenting something that is subject to interim approval, which we didn't get into here, but that's something that 
has left the gamut of being experimental, but it's not quite ready to be in the next edition of the MUTCD, so we put it in this interim approval area. And oftentimes, you'll get a Department of Transportation that requests interim approval for an entire county or an entire state, for example. Great, that's really helpful, thanks. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of questions, as I said, from, from our uh, listeners. And this one uh, is for Tim uh, from Jason, and this is regards something you said very early on. Uh, can you please provide a link to the study finding 19% of folks living in rural areas, but 58% of crashes occurring in rural areas? Yes, certainly. And if I don't have it in the actual footer of the presentation, that information comes from the guide. Um, so I will go and make sure to find where that information comes from and what vintage and year it hailed. Okay, so we can specifically look to the guide for that answer. Um, here's a, a question and comment from Lenore regarding um, uh, shared bikeways and walkways. And this is from a New Jersey perspective. She says, the NJDOT standards allows a 10-foot bikeway walkway as long as the 10 feet are unobstructed in any way. This seems to work well in a small downtown environment when everyone, everything is moving slowly. Um, and, and so she asked, do you ever consider adding this type of walk, bikeway or walkway to your standards? It sounds like you have. Yeah, yeah the shared use path, and she's absolutely right. The minimum width is 10 feet clear. More often than not, you'll see people that pave a 12-foot facility because it guarantees that 10 feet will always be unobstructed. Um, we also showed the shoulders in one example. So yes, I think that as long as you have that 10-foot minimum, that's also consistent with the AASHTO bike guide, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. That continues through each design guidance. And even with that slide up near the very beginning, the fact that all of this comes from the same source material, this is not changing the width of any of those facilities. What it's doing is showing how it can be better applied in a small town environment. So. The minimum width is definitely something that I, uh, I know is consistent from guide to guide and uh, support the use of that because that's exactly how it's interpreted. That 10-foot clear minimum is perfectly acceptable. Great. So here's a, a question from Thomas uh, regarding uh, the different uses or the different needs of different types of bikers. So he says, generally, it's my understanding that sport bikers, uh, sport exercise bikers, like dedicated on-street bike lanes. However, more casual bikers like off-street bike paths or multi-use facilities. That's correct. And actually, that's why I think that building your network is a really good way to make sure that you're accommodating all of your users. A couple of the images showed you um, the pedestrian lane or the paved shoulder, for example. Um, and you'll often find that some bicyclists will elect the facility that allows them to go the speed at which they're most comfortable. And when those sport bicyclists get up to the speed where they're with shared traffic, then they're ter certainly comfortable just taking the lane and traveling with shared traffic. And then oftentimes you will find maybe that facility or maybe later down the road in that area you will have a need for and demand for a shared use path, for example. Um, so a lot of times people are saying, well, why do we have a, a bike route sign on the roadway and a shared use path separate from it? Because you're absolutely right. Those users are probably headed to different destinations. They're traveling at different speeds. And so they have different user needs as a result. Um, there sometimes is concern but saying that why are we putting facilities all over the place, making it unclear. Um, I would say that as long as your network communicates the messages, um, you can you can still find reasons to have both. Um, Andrew also touched on a, uh, an example where you may need a certain type of facility only in one direction. Um, there are lots of communities that have hills, uh, and lots of bicyclists know that it's way easier to travel with traffic when you're going downhill, but you're going much slower when you're going uphill. So that's a situation where you may want to have a bike lane for uphill movement, but you can do a shared lane condition downhill. And there's nothing that says that you have to be symmetrical in every application of your treatment. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, stepping back and looking at it from a network perspective, uh, it helps to answer the questions of which type of a bicyclist are we talking about. We've got other presentations that kind of rank, or they sort the bicycling population into different groups. You may have heard of the strong and fearless, enthused and confident, and interested but concerned. Um, so that's another way to kind of look at your network. Um, this guide doesn't split it up in that way, but in a lot of the trainings I give, I still help to match facility types to 
how confident and what type of bicyclist might enjoy it most. Tim, uh, just to piggyback on that a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm by that comment, to, you know, obviously reflects, you know, a, a decades long or, or over a hundred years long sort of tension or conversation among different bicycling communities and advocate groups, but it reminds me of the sort of planner's adage that, you know, everyone is a pedestrian, you know, at the end of the day, we're all, you know, whether you drive everywhere that last hundred feet, uh, we're all pedestrians, and, you know, I like to think of it in terms of these facility types in, some, in a similar way. Um, you may be an avid bicyclist right now, but um, 30 years from now when you're a senior citizen, you may prefer being, you know, in a wheelchair up on a side path versus on a bike lane. So we have to look at it, I, I think, as planners very holistically and think about the full spectrum of, of ages and abilities. Right. As a, as a one-time bicycle commuter, on a high-speed road, um, I understand that there's you know, different needs for different uh, circumstances. Uh, I, I did appreciate the draft that the trucks gave me from time to time, though. Um, question from uh, Thomas. Have you run into utility issues with the location of any specific type of facility, such as manholes, drainage facilities? And, and Tim, you did touch on this in your Jackson Hole example um, with the, the question of drainage. Um, but are there other things, other considerations to, uh, that you need to think about? Yeah. Yeah, actually, it's a good question. We do run into issues where you, you want to be aware of what facility type you're putting on uh, an existing roadway. I'd say the good news about rural applications and open drainage environments usually is that those types of, uh, in, that type of infrastructure is less common uh, in those facility types. But as you brought up, the, uh, the Jackson Hole, Wyoming example speaks also to the fact that if you're talking about uh, a more constrained right-of-way, putting the protected facility up at the sidewalk level is a great practice because it helped to avoid drainage. That also was an opportunity because they were relocating the utility poles themselves, and so that space was free and clear of that. So you would have a very different project outcome if you found out you needed to move those poles, for example. So when thinking about the facility types and what your roadway looks like now, what vision you have for it in the future, you can go about it a couple of different ways by saying, okay, if the clear space is there now, this is a great opportunity. If the clear space is not there now, but I know that maybe a roadway widening will happen at some point in the future, we'll put this facility type in our plan so that when the roadway is expanded, for example, or the shoulder is widened and they have to move some structures then, then the bike lane is not causing those structures to be moved, but the structures were going to be moved anyway, and you have that project opportunity. How about uh, physical barriers that separate uh, bike lanes from uh, automobile lanes, uh, and, and the, the issues that some traffic engineers have with putting up objects close to vehicle lanes? Uh, and concerns about you know vehicle damage hitting the tree. But, well, the purpose of, course, of the tree, of course, is to protect the bicyclist. But um, how do you how do you address that? Sure. There's a lot of guidance both in this guide, as well as in Ashto and NACTO guides. Mo mostly in the Ashto guide about how keeping uh, obstructions out of the right of way. And I'd say that with the advent of the protected and separated bike lanes, help to clarify the discussion between what separation you're placing between different um, travel lanes. So on the, most of these environments, if you're providing an on-roadway solution, such as a wide shoulder or a bike lane or a separated bike lane, anything that you're placing in between the bicyclist and the moving traffic has to still go outside of the clear zone for what the, the travel with clear zone needs to be for those vehicles. And then if you're putting up some sort of a, a separation between the two, a lot of you have probably seen what is referred to as a flex post or a flexible delineator that separates bicyclists from vehicles. These are supposed to be what is known as crashworthy, which means it's a deterrent. You don't want to hit it, but if you do hit it, it's going to crumple and either bounce back up or it will break away. So this is intended to avoid damage to the motorist, to the bicyclist, to the vehicle. It's intended to separate the two of you but it's not supposed to be something that's, that harms the, the users or the vehicles. So it's important to know that putting in a separation of that kind needs to be crashworthy, and there's guidance for what those are allowed to be and what those should be. If you're moving towards more of a fixed environment, 
or a fixed object, like you gave the example of a tree, you want to make sure that tree is still outside of that clear zone or that you've provided enough of that visual and physical separation from, in this case, it would be something more akin to a side path or a protected separated bike lane. The Jersey barrier example that was shown still must be located outside of that clear zone. So as far as putting in objects between different roadway uh, elements, you still need to follow the design guidance uh, for separation of that. And so this doesn't ask you to do anything that those don't already require. So when coming up with the design, you need to make sure that you know that you're far enough away from those fixed object uh, hazards. OK, we have a, a quick question from James regarding uh, advisory shoulders. And he asks, have there been any studies regarding their effect on vehicle speeds? That is a good question, and I do not know the answer, but I do know that as part of the monitoring requirements that you should look at in your application of this type of a treatment, you are supposed to take note of what is happening to roadway performance, motorist compliance, and one of those factors is vehicle speed. So I would, I would encourage anybody to say, okay, now that we're in the experimentation phase with this type of facility treatment, we definitely want to know what some of the other public works, roadway engineers, and uh, planners in these communities that have implemented them. Um, I actually do know the transportation director for the city of Bloomington. Uh, she's, a, she's an alum and a colleague of mine. So that's one of the questions I could say, hey, how is this performing? And what impact is it having on speeds? Was speeding a problem beforehand? Is it now? So that's, that's a good question. I don't know if it's at the white paper level of explanation, but I do know that that is something that is the curiosity of anybody that is interested in implementing these. Great. Uh, turning now to the, the Appleton Trails Master Plan, a uh, question from Carl, uh, and he's asking, I think, about the, 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 um, the, the heat map and the online comment tool that, you know, where the uh, public can pin something to a map. Uh, what online tools did you use for that? Um, I can speak to the commenting map. Um, it's a great little technology. We've evaluated it and used different versions of this. Um, but this one, it's the company's called communityremarks.com. So if you go to their website, you can learn more about it. If you want to see our map that we use for projects or that was used for Appleton, it's communityremarks backslash S-E-H. Um, and that can be used for not only for geographic um, coded uh, commenting so you click on a Google map and you leave a you leave a comment there it can be categorized um, but it can also you can also leave general comments that can be categorized into buckets the cool thing about that tool is that um, well one it's less expensive than some of the other uh, alternatives out there but it also can be you at the end of the project you export all the comments as a KML file so that can be put in the GIS um, but uh, it can also just be opened up in Google Earth so you can zoom back in you know a year from now and sort of you know as you're working in a project in a section of town or a neighborhood go back and look at all the comments that people left and um, show that we're listening um, Tim you may be familiar with that heat map uh, website um, but that was something that uh, Fred set up on the Elta side. Yeah, that's something that we have access to, and it's basically very similar in the community remarks where people draw their preference or they trace on a line, um, either in a public environment setting or just in a web setting. And it creates a heat map based on the frequency with which users do it. Um, I will have to get back to you on whether that's something that was entirely in-house or if we use something that was prepackaged. I think, you know, if somebody leaves that question in the chat and we get a printout of the chat, we can follow up with, with that because um, that's a, I forget the name of it. It's a company. It's another vendor out there, and those, that mapping tool is, is pretty economical, um, but we can follow up and give you the link. I forget the name of the company. Sure. I can, I can send you the, uh, the questions, and you can reply directly to the, uh, the, the attendee. Um, here's a question from, from Kate regarding rumble strips um, to separate shared facility uh, cycle tracks or pedestrian spaces. And, and she says that she's gotten some pushback because of the noise. Yes, that's a good question. And that's often one of the um, concerns that users that live along a rural cross-section have with regard to noise on how frequently those rumble strips are being hit. Um, the intent of a rumble strip is obviously to prevent um, 
motorists from leaving the roadway, whether they be distracted or otherwise. And so when it comes to a design treatment, the rumble strip is really intended to keep the roadway safe for heavy vehicles and users of the roadway from a safety perspective. So the rumble strips should not necessarily be considered a treatment that was necessary purely for the bicycle facility to be added. But in my opinion, more often than not, the rumble strips should be part of the roadway design anyway. The gaps that you place in them should be spaced at that 10 to 30 foot arrangement that Ashto and this guide recommend so that bicyclists can maneuver around potential obstructions in the shoulder. So I think it's important to structure the discussion such that the rumble strips are there for motorist safety. The separation that the rumble strip provides from the bicycle facility is an after-the-fact treatment whereby the rumble strip's design is changed slightly so that bicyclists can go around issues. Okay, um, regarding the, the use of utility uh, rights-of-way, uh, do you have any difficulty uh, securing cross-easements? This is uh, coming from Lenore. Uh, to do a, a bikeway, she says, uh, that seems like almost an impossible task. That's a good question, and it's not impossible, but it is tricky. Um, in some work that I've done in the northern suburbs uh, north of Chicago, uh, there was a utility corridor uh, that was a little bit in a similar manner. Uh, and the, uh, the electrical company uh, that manages that right-of-way, that owns that right-of-way, turns out they were willing to have a discussion about that um, and that it would be a lease arrangement and that you do have to enter into a legal um, agreement for how this space will be used and the lease terms themselves can be very inexpensive but it's really just a vehicle to provide that uh, indemnification and who is protected and under what um, situation. They're not that unique that you can't find an example of someone who has navigated that process. Um, and if it's not impossible, but it does require somebody to be willing to find a contact who's in the real estate department for that utility and just make the uh, recommendation or make, make the introduction to have that discussion. Um, the good news is, is that they have been done. Um, they can protect, they provide for the right amount of protection that you need. It's usually at some point it becomes the real estate attorney for the utility company talking with the city attorney for how are we going to make this work. Um, once that agreement can be forged, and there are examples of how they've been written in other contracts, um, then it becomes much easier for implementation. I would say that you don't want to rule it out entirely in the planning phases of a project, um, but you do want to be aware that there will be a need to do that step at some point when you're ready for implementation. So here, here's another question, and it gets to the... Um, some of the discussion that you had on pedestrian lanes and um, you described them as uh, interim or temporary and the, the question is well, interim between what? Um, obviously the lack of a lane but then if it's interim then what's the next step that is desired and, and what's, the like, what's the likelihood of that actually happening? Yeah, and that's, that's exactly the reason it was not located in the heart of the guide under visually separated, because those engineers doing the review of this content were asking the same questions. They said, okay, well, how long of a period are we talking? How long of a distance are we talking? And there hasn't been consensus yet on either of those items. So I would say that if it's a very short stretch, or you know that we need to restripe the roadway to provide space now, and we're planning on resurfacing next year, those are the types of examples where you start to look at it and go, okay, can we do something now and then make it better down the line? So I don't have a hard answer for you. That's the reason it's been pulled into the key connection chapter of the guide. We're still trying to find a good way to answer those questions, um, and I, I'm curious to see where the discussion goes as well. Okay, well, we'll take that as a conditional response. Um, exactly. <laughs> From uh, Michelle, did you ever work with business owners to implement associated features such as bike racks or providing bike-to-work incentives? Yes, we have. Um, I always I joke because if you always go to the bike shop owner first, they're the most likely ones to say yes. Um, you do get a lot of support in some districts when they know that there is a demand for bike racks. Um, I've had mixed success 
with bike racks in districts that are very recreational because there are a lot of people that have a lot of interest for increasing the amount of bike parking in a downtown or near a restaurant or a brewery, for example. And so what you'll find is they like the idea of bike racks. They like the idea of incentives to get people to bike to the businesses um, if that brings more customers. You don't want to necessarily do so at the expense of on-street parking. So if you're talking about doing a bike corral, for example, or a lot of bike parking in a parking lane, you may want to find a space somewhere in the grass in the nearby town square or the park where it might be a little less of a uh, controversial improvement. But I would say starting with the, the Chambers of Commerce, tourism boards, and like I said, the bike shop usually is more amenable than your typical business owner. Start there and see what successes you may have. Um, but yeah, we've had some good luck in putting in a bike rack. Um, and as, as Andrew mentioned, sometimes saying, well, we can do a bike corral in the summer. Is that okay? Bring it in for the season um, and just kind of bolting it down and then taking it out in the winter. Um, those things are pretty heavy, so they don't move around all that much. So even temporary and seasonal installations might be a way to get the more um, hesitant business owner to say, okay, I'll give it a shot. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Tim, could you back up one slide? We have a bunch of questions, um, people asking about the website. Uh, for the guide, and and there's there's the interactive guide, and people can search the FHWA website for uh, for this publication as well. Um, <clears throat> we are now at the end of the presentation. This has been it's been a lot of fun for me. I've learned an awful lot, and stuff that I will take home, uh, literally take home to my town uh, for work there. Uh, reminder to folks logging your credits. This is event number nine one one eight six one six, and this has been recorded, and you can find the recording on our YouTube channel. And I want to thank our, our two presenters today, Andrew Dane and Tim Gustafson, for this terrific presentation. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.